Okay, so here we are. This is now the third Sunday in ordinary time. And uh, this is also the Sunday that has been designated, uh, at least in the United States, as the, as the Sunday designated to the Word of God. So you'll hear a lot of that this weekend, Word of God Sunday, which uh, really is just, it's calling attention um, to the often misinterpreted place of the Bible in Catholic life. And it's, it's this Sunday is meant to highlight the preeminence of scripture in, in the Catholic church. Uh, so, so word of God Sunday. All right, we'll go ahead and start with our prayer then in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord, send the radiance of your light to shine in our hearts. Make us true to your teaching. Keep us free from error and sin. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So uh, we don't get many readings from the book of Jonah, but, but uh, here we have one. Y you know, it's, it's interesting because we don't get a whole lot of readings from the book of Jonah, but Jonah is probably one of these stories from the Old Testament that just about everybody knows the story of Jonah, right? Getting swallowed up by the fish or the whale or what, whatever it was that, that they say swallowed him. But uh, every, everybody knows the story of Jonah. So uh, I want, let's, we'll start there. And, and I do want you, <clears throat> as we kind of look at Jonah, and then when we go back to Mark, think about how the two work together, okay? Um, so, of course, Jonah, I'm not going to read it all to you, but it's recounting the episode where Jonah is, he's, he's been called by God. Uh, he did not want to go. He's a prophet. He did not want to go to Nineveh. Um, so he, he actually tried to run away from God, remember, by getting on the ship. So we'll take a little detour right there and think, why would he, if he is a prophet and he is that close to God, why would he think he could run away from God by getting on a ship? Um, somebody can correct me because off the top of my head, I've just blanked and I can't remember who it was, Nathan or Samuel, I think probably Nathan. The one that the man came from, I don't remember where, uh, he had leprosy, right? And then he came to he came to this prophet and the prophet told him to go bathe in the pool. And when he did, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Remember, if you remember that. And he, uh, he asked if he could take a cartload of dirt back to his home so that he could worship the Hebrew God in his, in his home. Okay. So there was this, this idea in the Mediterranean pagan world and the, the Hebrews were not unaffected by this, but it was this idea that the gods were in some sense, geographically located, that they had an area of the earth that they over, that they were over and they couldn't cross into the realm of another god. So for, uh, for you know, this man who was cured of leprosy to be able to adequately worship the Hebrew god, thank you, Elisha. So it was not Nathan or Samuel. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Wrong on both counts. But, but uh, so the idea is he takes the cartload of dirt back because then geographically the god of the hebrews can be present there think of it kind of like like an embassy right it's a it's a it's a piece of sovereign territory within a foreign land and now this now he can now now god can be present to him even outside his realm because he's brought this earth back so that being said that's why jonah thought he could just get on a boat and sail far enough away that he would be out of the range of the Hebrew God. Um, 
which is, of course, not true. Uh, and <clears throat> of course, then we know the story. The storm comes. They offer all these sacrifices and prayers. Nothing happens. Finally, finally Jonah says, I know what's going on. It's my God. He's angry with me. Um, I will sacrifice myself uh, to appease him, and then he will it will calm the storm, and you will all be saved. So he goes into the water. He's swallowed up, and then three days later, he's spit back out onto the beach, um, and then he still has to go to Nineveh. Okay, so so there you go. He still has to do it, and when he gets to Nineveh, he he goes through the city telling them that in 40 days, they have 40 days to repent of their sin or God will destroy the city. And the Ninevites, uncharacteristically of almost anyone else in the Bible, right? The Ninevites listen and they actually do repent. And they, it says they fast and they put on sackcloth, which was a sign of penance. Um, and they, they, they do repent of their sin and God spares the city. Um, okay. The reason I, I think this is important is because in the gospels, not the gospel today, but in the gospels, <clears throat> if you remember, uh, they, the, the people ask Jesus for a sign. They say, give us a sign. And Jesus's response is, this generation will get no sign except the sign of Jonah. Okay, so a lot of people, what is the sign of Jonah? What does that mean? So the sign of Jonah is this. You have a, I wouldn't call it, Jesus is not a reluctant prophet, but Jesus was sent to the people to proclaim repentance, right? Um, and you look at the people on the boat, what are the people on the boat doing? They are offering prayers and sacrifices that are no longer efficacious. They don't work in a sense. The only thing that is going to calm the storm is for the one who was sent by God, who is Jonah, who is Jesus, to offer himself as a sacrifice to save the others, okay, to, to save the others whose prayers and sacrifices no longer work, all right, and then what does he do? He goes, uh, he's swallowed by the whale, which we would look at that in terms of an archetype of Christ swallowed by the tomb, he goes down into the depths where he is in the belly of the whale. So he's in darkness at the bottom of the ocean, presumably. And he's there for three days. And then the, the whale uh, spits him out on the shore. Okay. And then what does he do after he spit out on the shore? He, he goes and he proclaims, he goes, he goes and he, he continues to, pro to, to proclaim his mission and uh, he proclaims 40 days. He's in Nineveh for 40 days proclaiming repentance. And what does Jesus do? He obviously he dies. He sacrifices. He offers himself. He goes into the tomb for three days. He's resurrected. And then after his resurrection for 40 days, he stays with the apostles and disciples, uh, teaching them and preparing them for what, uh, what is going to happen. Further than that, where God, through Jonah, tells the Ninevites they have four, that, that in 40 days, if they have not repented, uh, God is going to destroy the city. Well, historically, depending on when you think Jesus actually died and rose, um, but regardless of that, you still have roughly a 40-year period from the time of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection, his ministry, death, and resurrection, to the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Okay, so again, 40 is a big number for the Hebrews. It meant a time of trial and testing. If you go back 
uh, through the Old Testament. You know, you have the, um, you know, you have the 40 days where, uh, you know, Moses is, is in the desert for 40 days until he, until he comes across uh, God present in the burning bush. Then Moses leads the Hebrews out of Egypt and they wander the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years. Jesus himself, he, he, after his baptism, he goes in the wilderness to be tested for 40 days. Um, and then after his resurrection, he is there with the apostles and disciples for 40 days. And then the Jews are given 40 years to repent before the city is destroyed um, because they don't, because as, as a collective, they do not repent. Uh, and, and okay, so that is what is meant by the sign of Jonah. Any questions about the sign about that? That's a lot, but uh, it's um, it's a lot more than being swallowed by a fish. How's that? Just let that suffice to say that the sign of Jonah. Well, a, a lot of people they 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 get the sign of Jonah. They get the symbolism of being swallowed by the fish and the archetype of of going into the depths and then after three days being spit out again. But they miss the whole 40 days in Nineveh after that, which in, in, in many ways is even more important. Um, because if you, if you think about when the gospels are written, most of them are, are, we, we believe are written, uh, either just before or just after the, uh, the destruction of, of Jerusalem, probably mo it depends on who you like as a scripture scholar, I guess. Some, uh, some, I guess the newest, the, the newest scholarship, predominantly you will find the argument in favor of a pre-destruction date to the gospels. Um, and then some of the older scholarship says, no, they think they were written in probably the eighties, the but a lot of the newer scholarship is saying, no, they were, they were more likely written in the fifties, uh, possibly early sixties. And the reason they think that is because this idea of the sign of Jonah was very important uh, to the preaching of the apostles and the preaching of the early church. This idea of repent or Jerusalem is going to be destroyed for its lack of faith. That apocalyptic vision was very important in the early church. And you would think if they wrote the gospel in 80 AD after the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, then they would have mentioned that. That's the that that's one of the the crux of the argument for a lot of the new scholarship is that's a pretty big thing to omit uh, if you're writing about this stuff, okay? And and none of them mention it. None of the gospel writers mention the destruction of the temple. So that that leads a lot of scholars to think that they all they they must have been written prior to even Paul. Paul never mentions it. Uh, but we also know Paul was killed in, I think, 64 AD. So all of his letters had to have been written prior to that. Okay. Any questions about that? Any comments about that? So that is Jonah. And uh, I think two big things to get out of Jonah are when God calls, do we try to run away from the call or do we accept it? Uh, in a lot of ways, Jonah is, is kind of like when Jesus gives the parable of the landowner and the two sons. Remember, he says one, one of the sons, the dad tells them to go out and work in the fields. And one of the sons, he says, I'm not going to do it but then he feels bad and he goes and he does it. And then the other son just says, he says he's going to do it, but then he doesn't. Okay. Uh, Jonah's kind of like that son where he's, he's a prophet and God calls him and he's ready. And then he says, you know what? I, 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 I don't think I'm going to do that. And so, so he ends up not doing it. Okay. Uh, but Jonah, Jonah, tries to escape. So again, the idea is when God calls, what do we do? What is our response? Do we say yes 
and, and go forward or do we try to run away? Um, but not only that, the other thing to get out of this is no matter how far we have gone, we can always repent. Uh, repentance is always offered, is, is always available. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so now we'll move on to, to Mark. Uh, if this reading sounds familiar, it is because this reading is just Mark's version of what we read in John last Sunday. Okay, so it's basic. So again, I, I don't feel like I need to necessarily read it because it's pretty much the same. It's uh, Jesus goes to Galilee and he collects Peter and Andrew. And then it talks about him collecting um, James and John. Uh, and, and what does he say to them? He tells them, come with me and I will make you fishers of men. And it says they abandoned their nets and follow him, followed him. And then he gets James and John, who were also in their boats. They left their father Zebedee in the boat and followed Jesus. So kind of the idea there is, again, when God calls, are we prepared to drop whatever we're doing and follow God? Okay. Uh, one thing I do kind of want to clarify, this is, this would be, I guess I, I would say speculation because we don't necessarily know for sure because it's not really mentioned much, but, you know, one of the first miracles recorded is Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law. So Peter is at least presumably at this point, Peter is married. Peter has a family. And we would assume that most of the other apostles and disciples had families as well. The only one that we know uh, that we know did not was not married and did not have a family was John. Okay, so Peter, so a lot so the, this morning the, the group asked, well, well, what what happened to their families? I mean, did they just like walk off their job and go, follow. I mean, who's, who's paying for their family's food? Who's, or did they just leave? No, not necessarily. Because if you, if you read the gospels carefully, what you see is Jesus, even though they go with Jesus, you know, they stayed in Galilee for a while. Jesus kind of makes the rounds to these towns, uh, but they're all relatively close. So they could have easily fished in the morning and preached in the afternoon or gone and followed Jesus. In the, does, that, does that make sense? Like they, they could have easily gone and done this stuff with Jesus and even still gone home at night. Uh, but there is also, there are a couple of places where it does mention that the, the families following with them, traveling when they, when they start to go further. The other thing I would encourage, I would say to look at is, pull out a map of Israel at the time of Jesus. Uh, well, I guess a map of Israel even today, but just if you pull out a map of Israel, Israel at the time of Jesus, and you see where some of these towns are, you know, the whole thing is like, <clears throat> if you have say Jerusalem and Bethlehem, Bethlehem is about five miles from Jerusalem. You know, this, the whole country in fact, I looked at, I was looking at it this morning. The whole country of Israel is about the size of the island of Sicily. Okay, so this is not, it's not Texas, I guess is what I'm saying. So when we're thinking about Jesus traveling around, it's not like they're going hundreds of miles. Um, that very often going from town to town, they might only be going a few miles. And so they could very easily go to this town and Jesus could preach for the day, and then they could go back to the back home at night. Uh, that's that's very very reasonable. I, I was talking about like this morning the a a a Roman soldier was expected to be able to march with a full load twenty miles a day. I know for some of us we think I cannot even fathom walking twenty miles in one day, 
but a Roman soldier was expected to be able to walk 20 miles a day. That's a lot. But if all, but if, but if that's how you get around, I, I'm not going to say it wouldn't be exhausting, but you know, you could do it. Um, so I guess that, that would be just what I'm asking you to do is, is when we're thinking about this, I don't, don't, don't think that when Jesus calls his apostles, they are abandoning their families. That's what I'm trying to get. Okay. Uh, because that was actually something people were very concerned about this morning that I, that was Jesus asking them to just abandon their families and their responsibilities. No, no. Okay. And then real quick, I want to say something about James and John, the sons of Zebedee. <clears throat> so historically, they think that Zebedee was a priest, uh, that he was a, he was, he was a, 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 a temple priest, um, much like, uh, like Zechariah, right? Where Zechariah, he would go, he was not a priest that stayed in the temple all the time, but he was a, he was a priest. Um, and so presumably James and John would also both be uh, in line at some point to become priests themselves. And I think this is very interesting because you see after Jesus calls them, James and John are witnesses to a lot of things that the other apostles are not most notably is the transfiguration. So, and I, and I just, I want I want you to, I want to put this together real quick. So in the temple, you have the Holy of Holies where only the priests can go, right? Only the priests are there, are allowed to be in that presence of God inside the Holy of Holies of the temple. So what is the transfiguration? The transfiguration, remember Jesus, he tells Peter, James, and John to come up with him. He tells the other apostles to stay and pray at the foot of the mountain. They go up the mountain where they witness the transfiguration. The transfiguration is they're seeing Jesus in his glory. So they are in that sense coming into contact with this presence of God that is unknowable to most people. And he, so who does he invite? Who does Jesus take up there with him? James and John, who are priests or, or, or who are able to be priests. So Jesus does not do anything that is not all, that is not in line, quote unquote, with Judaism. And who is Peter? Peter is the, the he's going to be the Pope, right? He's going to be the first head of the church. So Peter gets to see this. And then even later, James, James is, he becomes the bishop of Jerusalem, right? Uh, so the, the most important city, James becomes in charge of that city. And uh, so again, them being in line to become temple priests is, is very significant. Okay, so again, and, and how does that tie in to Jonah? It's, it's this idea, again, that when God calls, are we ready to leave what we are doing and follow God? Um, and, and very often, God takes us to places that are unexpected, uh, in unexpected ways and by unexpected means. I had a, a friend, a friend that I met at uh, when I was working at Mary Queen. Um, his name was Tom, and uh, Tom. And now this, now it's all been so long ago. Uh, I cannot remember. I think he was a widower, but at a fairly young age. And then his kids, when his kids became adults, he uh, he was asked. Or, or somehow he basically somehow he got in with the Mary Knoll priest. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Mary Knoll priest. He got in with the Mary Knoll priest, and I guess his background was in um, education. He was, and so he went to Africa with the Mary Knoll priest to help start a school in a village. And the idea was he would stay there 
and run the school until they could until he could train someone to be able to run the school and then he would come home and what i, I just think it's funny you know you never know how it's going to work when you actually listen to god so so tom did that and it was supposed to be a six month mission and when i met him he had been in africa for 13 years and and he said you know he just he just couldn't say no and he just fell in love with what he was doing and he got to where he said the only time he would ever he would you know he would come home at Christmas and things, he usually come home around before Thanksgiving and stay till the new year and, and see his kids and grandkids. And he'd come home, uh, he'd come home when he had to go to the doctor. Um, but he, he loved being over there and, and doing that work. And, uh, and, and it was just, you know, and I, I ended up getting to where, you know, I looked forward to his yearly visits um, and, and because he and I would usually, you know, try to go out, go out to King's beer garden a few times while he was, while he was in, while he was in town. And it's just, you know, and like he talks about, you know, he never expected, he expected to do that six month stint and then come home and go back to his life. But, but then, you know, he realized he loved what he was doing and he loved, what he was doing. He loved the people he was working with. And he had 13 years. Um, and then when he did eventually come home to stay, it was just because his, he was getting, he was past retirement age and his health got to the point where he couldn't live like he was living in those villages he needed to be. But I mean, could you imagine that? Just, you know, just answering that call, that little call to do this one little thing and that turns into this whole new life um i'm going to mention something here jason well when saint bernadette started um all of us who came into the into the newly forming church of saint bernadette were from somewhere else uh i was from saint paul's i had been teaching kindergarten cce at saint paul's and people from, were from everywhere. And so Father Frank, who was the original pastor, came up to me and he said, what did you do at St. Paul's? I said, I, I taught kindergarten CCE. He said, well, good, now you're in charge of kindergarten CCE. And it went from there. You know, 40 something years later, I'm still doing uh, volunteer work at the church. And I spearheaded along with some other people the religious education department at St. Bernadette from the ground up. And I had no, no uh, training and all that, but God gave us all we needed. We had each other and it was a great group of people. And that was all of us answering a call right here in our own neighborhood. You know, we, did, we weren't asked to go to Timbuktu. We were asked to just uh, witness to Jesus right here in Gulag City, Texas. I think at the, at the risk of getting all sentimental and nostalgic, <laughs> you know, I, I actually, I, I, I think about that one. And I think that's a great point. God is not all, in fact, very rarely is God going to call you to go to Africa and start a school. Most often God is going to call you to, to, to be a minister for him right here in your own community. You know, and I think because, and, and again, it, it's, it, uh, please excuse me, my nostalgia, but the, uh, you know, I, I actually, you know, I, I looked forward to the, like the men's acts retreats every year uh, because one, I really enjoyed it going with the guys and it was a time I could actually just relax and it was like a retreat for me, right? Instead of having to be on, I could just relax and be there. But then I think, you know, the men, and the women that God would pull out of themselves to come take on these different roles. And it's not just with acts. I mean, you could say it with anything you could say, you know, I, I, cause like with, with, you know, Becky and Alan, you know, with the RCIA team, right. You know, and uh, you know, and I think about the people that Chris has found to be the spiritual life committee. It's like, 
these people were kind of drawn out of these places to take on these roles that they never imagined taking on. And then it ends up almost seeming like it was tailor made for you. Um, or like I said, like the men that, especially because I'm looking at Patrick right now, that were maybe reluctantly pulled to, to, to be a, a director of a retreat, right? But you know what? Somehow it all just works out. Um, if, and the idea is, again, if we, if we just let, if we listen and we let God lead us instead of us trying to tell God, this is where I want to go. Now you now you make me think this is the right place or instead say, where do you want me to go? What can I do? How can I serve this kingdom the best? Right? Uh, God will put you where you need to be and you will find that very often it's not a place you thought you were going to be. And, and, and you will often find you're much better for it. I know I've told some of you this many, many times, so I'm not going to tell the whole long story, but you know, some of you know this, some of you don't, but you know, um, I, I never intended to work for the church ever. I could not, and, and, and people that knew me before I worked for the church, if you had told them that I'd end up working for the church one day, they would have laughed at you. You know, I, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I wanted to be my, well, one of my, one of my job ideas was to go work for Dine Corp. I don't know if any of you know what Dine, Dine Corp is, uh, is, uh, is a mercenary corporation at the time and, and like Blackwater. That's what I wanted to go do. And I just remember when I told my dad I was going to go work for Dine Corp because we worked with them in the Middle East. And I realized they're doing the same job I am and getting paid 10 times as much and they don't have to shave every day. So that seemed like a pretty sweet deal. And I just remember, I told my dad, I said, I'm going to go be a mercenary. And my dad just said, That's, that seems like a very childish way to make a living. So, so that kind of, but, but again, we, you know, and it was, I was, I was actually a teacher at Mount Carmel and my department head was uh, a La Salette priest named Father Ron, who was living at Mary Queen. And when Mount Carmel was going through their closing, a lot of us were trying to figure out what are we going to do? And Father Ron told me Mary Queen had this job called adult faith director. And would I be interested in that? And I had never even heard of an adult faith director before. But I went in and interviewed and uh, it just happened that the, the interview panel was full of veterans. And so they hired me and, uh, and there you go. But I, I, I would never would have seen myself here. So again, it's, it's, I think a lot of it is, is being open to where God, and now, I, and now I can't imagine doing anything else, by the way, you know, so it's, it's, uh, you know, that, that very often God pulls us in a direction that we never thought we would go. And, and if we will only listen, we'll find out that we are much better for it. Okay. Um, any, any thoughts or anything, anything you guys want to share before we jump into Corinthians? Corinthians is, is pretty simple. So we have, we have, we have time. Any, anything? All right. <clears throat> All right. Well, Corinthians. So he's, when Paul starts out, he says, I tell you, brothers and sisters, time is running out. All right. So that's a good, what does that mean? Time is running out. So in, in many of his letters, especially his earlier letters, Paul is under the impression, and, and, and a lot of Christians were, even some a lot, of, even a lot of the apostles were, that Jesus's return was imminent, that it was going to happen within their lifetime, okay? So again, the whole thing is, if, if Jesus is coming back tomorrow, you don't need to be worried about your kid's college fund right? You don't need to be worried about getting that sofa reupholstered. You, you, you have a very singular focus. If you know Jesus is coming back tomorrow or even next week or even two weeks from now, 
So what Paul is telling them is <clears throat> you need to stop all these worldly concerns um, because time is running out. And he, he, he's, that's what he says. So let those having wives act as not having them, um, which basically means be celibate. That's, that's really what it, it means. Um, those weeping is not weeping. Rejoicing is not rejoicing. Buying is not owning. Those using the world is not using it fully. So again, removing yourself from worldly concerns and being only concerned with spiritual things, getting yourself right for God. Okay. And then he says, for the world in its present form is passing away. So again, when Paul says that, he is talking about the imminence of Christ's return. But later Christians will, will read that and they'll say, yes, this is what Paul, this is what Paul had in mind. But of course, that's not what happens. So how do we read this now? Because if it's inspired, it still has to have meaning. So the meaning of for the world in its present form is passing away that did happen um, because the world was passing from being a pagan world to being a Christian world. So the world that they all inhabited, the world that they knew was passing away, the world of paganism and the Roman empire and all of that was on its way out. And the new world was going to be Christendom. Okay, the new world was going to be Christian, the Christian Roman Empire, uh, and, the, and, and the new king was going to be Christ. Uh, the new faith, the new, there would no longer be sacrifices, there would no longer be all of these pagan things. That world was passing away, and the new Christian world was going to come into being. So that's kind of how we read it. Now, and I guess if you want to look at it, you could say, well, yes, we don't necessarily think of Jesus's coming as imminent. Uh, there's still a good lesson here in that time is time is running out. You we we don't know how long we have to get it right. Right. The whole idea of, you know, a deathbed confession is a luxury that we may not have. So don't count on that, right? Uh, I know I've told you guys the story of my grandfather that got baptized by a Catholic priest about two weeks before he died. And my youngest brother's response to that was, well, I guess he beat the system because, <laughs> because he was baptized, all his sins are forgiven. He's a saint. Okay, um, although I just wish you could have seen the Baptist preacher's face when that Catholic priest walked in the door to baptize Paul Paul, <laughs> because it was it was it was uh, it was really something. How's that? It was really something. But um, but 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 you know it it, it was is good. I, I think it they were in orange. I don't know if any of you know where orange is around Port Arthur area so an orange is not a big area and so they they knew each other i mean there's there's not that many Catholics. there's not there's that's, that is there's a catholic church there and there's 500 baptist churches and they all don't get along but that's east texas right there's a baptist church every four blocks and they all hate each other that's if you've never been to east texas that really pretty much defines east texas right there so um but but anyway, so we that that's the idea. We may not we may not all get that luxury. So <clears throat> get it right now. Um, and of course, this is all kind of uh, this is this is timely, you know, with us coming up. Lent is coming up pretty soon in about a month, right? Lent starts. So maybe start to thinking think about what what can we do. Uh, to make this year special? What can we do to make this Lent special, uh, especially with everything going on? So, okay. Jason, do yes. they, you know how with Advent, when Advent 
uh, several weeks before they start preparing you with the readings yeah. of the estiological stuff. Is that the same coming up to Lent? They're starting to have some of the Lenten themes. Yeah, you're going to kind of start. Yeah. Some, especially in the new Testament, you know, you'll see a little bit about this, uh, building up to Lent, which all of Lent is then just building up to Palm Sunday, right. Which is then building up to Easter. So, so yeah, it's, it's very intentional. I think I, I, I know we, we all know that, but to, to really stress that, that when the church sets out these readings for the liturgical year, none of this is accidental. It's, it's all very intentional. And uh, I, I know for one, I'm, I, I like that because it tells you, you know, this has all been really very well thought out and it all has a purpose and it's all driving a narrative. So, okay. Think, any, any, anything else? Any other questions or comments? We might get done a little early. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I do, uh, again, just let you guys know, and if you haven't been back to mass or if you're not reading the bulletins or whatever, I don't, I don't know how things are working necessarily, but uh, Matthew and I are going to attempt, and I'm saying attempt, very forcefully because they've been having all kinds of technology issues here today. So we're hoping it all gets resolved. So the first Tuesday in February, we are going to try to have a, uh, a, a, an adult faith series start. But the idea is it's going to be both in person and on Zoom, like this is, at the same time. So the people at home look, watching on Zoom would be able to interact with, the, with what's going on live. So for people that feel comfortable enough and want that, they, they, they want some human contact, I don't know what it is, but for people that feel comfortable enough, they would be able to come up here. And then uh, it would also, um, so just, you know, hopefully that will go well and we're just hoping it, 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 we're seeing how it works because if it does work, you know, because, you know, we're thinking about like this, like this whole doing this Wednesday night thing, that's new. We've never done this. This is, we've never had a Wednesday night Bible study at St. Bernadette's as long as I've worked here. And <clears throat> so, uh, you know, it's kind of, and, and, you know, Matthew and I have noticed, you know, the, you know, the, the people that are attending and things like that. Um, so the idea is, well, okay, well, how do we post COVID continue to be able to offer this, but still have the in-person stuff for people that are ready for that? You, you know what I mean? Um, that this is a, a new way to reach people and we don't want to lose that. So, so anyway, so uh, that's what we're doing and hopefully maybe, you know, check it out. Or if, if somebody says, you know, I know we, when they started having mass again on Wednesday night, we lost several people. So hopefully that'll be something they can do. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and close and I'll let you guys get on with your evening. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and we'll pray glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. And I will see you all next week. <clears throat>